This is our lesson 8 for January the 22nd, 2017. It is from Unit 2 and it is titled Master Designer. Our devotional reading is from the book of Psalms, number 8. Our background scripture is from Psalms 104. And our printed passage is Psalms 104, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 24 through 30. And our key verse is Psalms 104, verse 24. And I'm reading from the NIV, and it reads, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Our lesson's aims are to ponder the diversity and complexity of God's creation, affirm God's wisdom in ordering the world as he did, and honor God by working to preserve the world's magnificent natural diversity. Our lesson is from the Faith Pathway publication, and we would like to read the introduction into our lesson, for it sets the tone of what we are to receive uh, from this lesson. The introduction reads, Our world is filled with amazing things, both naturally developed and and humanly developed, for mankind continues to invent marvelous and useful items. In our own lives, we can acknowledge our excitement when we develop something, whether it is on a big scale or small. Perhaps we put together a bookcase or found a way to fix the lawnmower or we invented the next iPhone. Our seeing that which we have orchestrated or put together operating as it should brings joy to our souls. If we are honest, we are even more delighted when someone acknowledges us for our labors. An expression of appreciation encourages us to do more for those who show appreciation. It's not a case of arrogance, but of pure delight. We find joy in doing good at any level. These words set a good entry as we look into the tone of our lesson, the master designer. For if we ourselves can find pleasure and joy in our ability to put things together, to create something, to develop things, to uh, provide uh, service to others, and then their appreciation once we receive the excitement uh, that overcame, overcame them as they received whatever service it was we provided or whatever the uh, situation was that we were able to apply ourselves to and correct it or bring it out with good results. If we ourselves can have that type of emotional reaction and receive that type of gratification, then Christ said it best in Matthew 7 and 11 where it reads, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? And we can look all around God's creation and see the many good gifts that God has given unto us. 
Now, the writer of this lesson uh, shared a story about him repairing a racetrack uh, for his children, for his boys. And uh, once he assembled it and put it together, uh, they were just excited by watching the cars going around the track and racing one another. And because of their excitement, uh, he added to the track. He enlarged it. He gave them even more cars because they were so appreciative of what their father had done. And their father was overwhelmed by the excitement, uh, by the enthusiasm that he, he experienced, that he saw in his boys while they were playing with the racetrack that he had assembled. And at the conclusion of this is where we get the scripture out of Matthew, the seventh chapter in the 11th verse, speaking of if we, uh, in spite of ourselves, if we can find room in our heart to do good for our children, then how much more will God our Father do for us if we ask of him? So our lesson today expounds upon the greatness of God. It, it highlights uh, the many wonderful things that are just uh, unlimited even in our, um, even in our small uh, effect of trying to identify and number and list all of the many things that God has created. But in our limited approach to that, we find out just how worthy God is of our praise. And our lesson is a follow-up from Psalms 103, but it lifts other scriptures to expound and to elaborate upon how great God is. So as we look at the beginning verses, uh, verses one through four, uh, let's see what scripture is saying to us in these verses. Praise the Lord, my soul, the Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord, our God, wraps himself in light as with the garment. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain or a tent. He lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and he rides on the wings of the wind. He makes angels his spirit and he ministers a flaming fire. Now the King James says he makes his angels spirits. He ministers a flaming fire and the NIV says he makes winds his messengers flames of fire his servants. In verse four, here we see again the power of, of God's creation, his ability to create from nothing and come out with something. When we see here that he says that he makes his angels spirits, angels is plural and spirits is plural. And here again, we see that God creates his servants. He creates the angel and he creates the spirit that indwells in the angel. So he, he develops a vessel where he can pour out the spirit, the effectiveness of the vessel that he creates and he joins them together. He creates them for his messengers. 
to go out to the other of his creation and inform and give messages at due seasons at appropriate times. And then it says that he also, he has ministers that are flames of fire as his servants as well. Now, <clears throat> when we speak of the wind in the NIV translated uh, with verse 4, uh, where in the King James it says he makes his angels spirits, but in the NIV it says he makes winds his messengers. Now we remember in uh, the 37th chapter of Ezekiel where God was prophesying, he was speaking. God was speaking to Ezekiel and he was telling Ezekiel to prophesy into the wind. And many times in scripture, wind is used in symbolism with spirit. And he also in the, Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, verses 9 and 10, he also talks about breath and breathing uh, into these dead, dry, disconnected bones. And we know that man came into being uh, out of Genesis um, in the second chapter and the seventh verse. Scripture tells us that God breathed into the nostrils of man and man became a living soul. So we recognize that air, wind is associated with life and inspiration and associated with the spirit of God. Um, I want to bring our attention to the latter part of verse four, which talks about the flames of fire. And um, there are two adjectives associated with fire. These are not the only two, but they are two. One that's listed in the text says a flaming fire. And then another adjective we use to identify fire sometime is a glowing fire. And there's a difference in the intensity of the flame from a glowing fire and a flaming fire. Uh, when we have a glowing fire, uh, usually we have uh, logs that are uh, used as the fuel for the fire. And once the logs are burned, uh, they have a orange, yellowish type of glow to them from the heat and the intensity of the fire. Now, the flame may not be present, but the glow, the warmth of the fire is still there. But when we have a flaming fire, we actually see the flames of the fire and now the fire is engulfed and it's intense. And the text says that his ministers are flaming fire. Now in the book of Malachi, the third chapter, uh, verses two and three, I want to talk, uh, just briefly, uh, about another description of uh, fire and it says but who can endure the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver 
he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, uh, there is a process that is used uh, to bring the metals, the ore of silver and gold to a perfected state. And that is, that is done uh, when the metals are placed into an oven and there is a intense heat and the flame of the fire is at a enormous rate. And what it is used for is to remove the impurities in the metal. It's to remove those impurities so that the metal comes forth as pure gold. And once the impurities are removed in the process, it's been said that you know when the impurities are gone, when you can see your reflection in the end results of the metal that you were heating. And so the process is continued until all the impurities are removed and then you can see your own reflection in the end result. And that is what God uses his ministers for is he intensifies the flame of their message. Uh, it's not for their own glory. It's not to bring recognition to them. It's not for the vessel that the message is contained in, but it is God's flaming spirit. And he conveys a message through his ministers to give to his creation so that it would remove the impurities that are found within us so that once they are gone, we are the reflection of God. And now we are in our completed form. Now, the book of John and the first chapter and verse 18 tells us that no one has seen God at any time except the only begotten son who is in the bosom of his father and he has declared him. So we know that we have not seen God in a personal or human form. And early in the text, it mentioned that God is so enormous that he wraps himself as a garment with his own light that he created. And he uses the heavens as a curtain stretched out to adorn the presence of God. So although we have not seen God, if we follow the statutes and the judgments and the uh, commandments of God in love, we know that we will remove those things that are not godly and become as God would have us to be. Now our lesson goes on and now it begins to talk about the uh, development of all of the wonderful things that God did in creation. And it begins to tell us starting at verse 24 and it says, how many are your works, Lord? It proposes a proclamation uh, at the same time, it signifies a question, uh, one that we are still finding out in this day and time. Every time there are new studies and research uh, uh, done into the waters that God created, into the atmosphere that God created, even into the earth itself, 
uh, we are constantly still finding out more about what God has created. And therefore, the latter part of that scripture says, in wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number. We can't even, we can't even uh, put a uh, numerical uh, uh, conclusion on what God has developed and how many of God's creatures there are because it's unknown to us. His uh, ability to create is so vast until uh, we can't actually put a number on it and limit it to a particular amount. Because if we were to do that in a few days, we would find that, oh, now that number has increased. So we can't establish the amount of God's creation because we didn't create it. And the creator is still allowing us to find out just how vast the creator is. It says both living things, large and small. And it goes on to tell us that the ships go to and fro and Leviathan, which you form to frolic there. Uh, speaking of Leviathan, uh, it's been by certain commentaries, it's been identified as a large uh, sea monster, uh, a dragon. Uh, some commentaries have even associated it with a certain order, uh, an order of uh, wickedness and evil and a large uh, system. Uh, but here it says that he allowed it to play. He allowed this uh, large body, this, uh, this dragon, uh, this sea monster, that he allowed it to play therein, that he uh, gives it a season uh, for its activities. And it says, all the creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. Let's, let's, let's go back and come forward again. It says, when you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. But when you hide your face, they are terrified. And when you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Isn't God magnificent? Isn't God unlimited? Isn't God far beyond our comprehension? Then what is God's expectations of us? That we would serve the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our mind, uh, that we would do those things that are pleasing and acceptable unto God. God is due our praise. And our praise should not just be because of what we receive. The uh, 28th verse mentioned about when he opened his hand, we are satisfied with good things. Um, it shouldn't just be uh, from what we're getting, but it should be for what God has done. When we look at God's creation, we should be overwhelmed. And it shouldn't be that we are serving or praising God 
because of the things that we receive, but we should be doing it out of honor and out of respect and out of reverence unto God because God is so awesome. There is none like unto God. Who can we compare God to? What person, what thing, what system, what element, what item? There is nothing that is in comparison to our creator. So as we leave you today, we just want to expound again upon uh, God's unlimited power, um, unlimited in all aspects, not just unlimited in God's ability to create and develop from nothing, but also that God is unlimited in his long suffering, in God's mercy, in God's grace, in God's kindness, in God's gentleness, in God's understanding. God is unlimited in all areas of life and those that we don't even understand or have yet to have found out. So let's give God his due praise. We hope and pray that something that was said in our lesson today uh, provided some insights uh, into the word of God. And uh, most importantly, our prayer is always that God will continue his blessings upon you and your family and upon all that God created. May he forever be with you as we leave you on this word. God bless you.